The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Edited by Christopher Tolkien. Read by Martin Shaw. Ainulindala, the music of the Ainur. There was Eru, the One, who in Ardur is called Iluvatar. And he made first the Ainur, the Holy Ones, that were the offspring of his thought. And they were with him before aught else was made. And he spoke to them, propounding to them themes of music, and they sang before him, and he was glad. But for a long while they sang only each alone, or but few together, while the rest hearkened, for each comprehended only that part of the mind of Viluvata from which he came. And in the understanding of their brethren they grew but slowly. Yet ever as they listened, they came to deeper understanding, and increased in unison and harmony. And it came to pass that Ilovatar called together all the Ainur and declared to them a mighty theme, unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed. And the glory of its beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Ainur, so that they bowed before Ilovatar and were silent. Then Iluvata said to them, Of the theme that I have declared to you, I will now that ye make in harmony together a great music. And since I have kindled you with a flame imperishable, ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if he will. But I will sit and hearken, and be glad that through you great beauty has been wakened into song. Then the voices of the Ainur, like unto harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and viols and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Ilovata to a great music. And a sound arose of endless interchanging melodies woven in harmony that passed beyond hearing into the depths and into the heights, and the places of the dwelling of Iluvata were filled to overflowing, and the music and the echo of the music went out into the void, and it was not void. Never since have the Ainur made any music like to this music, though it has been said that a greater still shall be made before Iluvata by the choirs of the Ainur and the children of Iluvata after the end of days. Then the themes of Ilovata shall be played aright and take being in the moment of their utterance, for all shall then understand fully his intent in their part, and each shall know the comprehension of each, and Ilovata shall give to their thoughts the secret fire, being well pleased. But now Ilovata sat and hearkened, and for a great while it seemed good to him, for in the music there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Vilavata. For he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. To Melkor among the Ainur had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, and he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. He had gone often alone into the void places, seeking the imperishable flame, for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own, and it seemed to him that Iluvata took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Yet he found not the fire, 
for it is with Iluvata. But being alone, he had begun to conceive thoughts of his own unlike those of his brethren. Some of these thoughts he now wove into his music, and straightway discord arose about him, and many that sang nigh him grew despondent, and their thought was disturbed and their music faltered. But some began to attune their music to his rather than to the thought which they had at first. Then the discord of Melkor spread ever wider, and the melodies which had been heard before foundered in a sea of turbulent sound. But Ilovata sat and hearkened until it seemed that about his throne there was a raging storm, as of dark waters that made war one upon another in an endless wrath that would not be assuaged. Then Ilovata arose, and the Ainur perceived that he smiled. And he lifted up his left hand, and a new theme began amid the storm, like and yet unlike to the former theme, and it gathered power and had new beauty. But the discord of Melkor rose in uproar and contended with it, and again there was a war of sound more violent than before, until many of the Ainur were dismayed and sang no longer, and Melkor had the mastery. Then again Iluvata arose, and the Ainur perceived that his countenance was stern, and he lifted up his right hand, and behold, a third theme grew amid the confusion, and it was unlike the others. For it seemed at first soft, and sweet, a mere rippling of gentle sounds in delicate melodies, but it could not be quenched, and it took to itself power and profundity, and it seemed at last that there were two musics progressing at one time before the seat of Iluvata, and they were utterly at variance. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow, and blended with an immeasurable sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. The other had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated, and it had little harmony, but rather a clamorous unison as of many trumpets braying upon a few notes. And it essayed to drown the other music by the violence of its voice, but it seemed that its most triumphant notes were taken by the other and woven into its own solemn pattern. In the midst of this strife, whereat the halls of Uluvata shook, and a tremor ran out into the silences yet unmoved, Uluvata arose a third time, and his face was terrible to behold. Then he raised up both his hands, and in one cord, deeper than the abyss, higher than the firmament, piercing as the light of the eye of Ilovata, the music ceased. Then Ilovata spoke, and he said, Mighty are the Ainur, and mightiest among them is Melkor, but that he may know, and all the Ainur, that I am Ilovata, those things that ye have sung, I will show them forth, that ye may see what ye have done. And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. Then the Ainur were afraid, and they did not yet comprehend the words that were said to them, and Melkor was filled with shame, of which came secret anger. That Ilovata arose in splendor, and he went forth from the fair regions that he had made for the Ainur, and the Ainur followed him. But when they were come into the void, Ilovata said to them, Behold your music! And he showed to them a vision, giving to them sight where before was only hearing. And they saw a new world 
made visible before them. And it was globed amid the void, and it was sustained therein, but was not of it. And as they looked and wondered, this world began to unfold its history, and it seemed to them that it lived and grew. And when the Ainur had gazed for a while and was silent, Ilovata said again, Behold your music. This is your minstrelsy, and each of you shall find contained herein, amid the design that I set before you, all those things which it may seem that he himself devised or added. And thou, Melkor, wilt discover all the secret thoughts of thy mind, and wilt perceive that they are but a part of the whole, and tributary to its glory. And many other things Ilovata spoke to the Ainur at that time, and because of their memory of his words and the knowledge that each has of the music that he himself made, the Ainur know much of what was and is and is to come, and few things are unseen by them. Yet some things there are that they cannot see, neither alone nor taking counsel together, for to none but himself as Ilovata revealed all that he has in store, and in every age there come forth things that are new and have no foretelling, for they do not proceed from the past. And so it was that as this vision of the world was played before them, the Ainur saw that it contained things which they had not thought. And they saw with amazement the coming of the children of Ilovata, and the habitation that was prepared for them, and they perceived that they themselves and the labor of their music had been busy with the preparation of this dwelling, and yet knew not that it had any purpose beyond its own beauty. For the children of Ilovata were conceived by him alone, and they came with the third theme, and were not in the theme which Ilovata propounded at the beginning, and none of the Ainur had part in their making. Therefore, when they beheld them, the more did they love them, being things other than themselves, strange and free, wherein they saw the mind of Ilovata reflected anew, and learned yet a little more of his wisdom, which otherwise had been hidden, even from the Ainur. Now the children of Ilovata are elves and men, the firstborn and the followers. And amid all the splendors of the world, its vast halls and spaces and its wheeling fires, Ilovata chose a place for their habitation in the deeps of time, and in the midst of the innumerable stars. And this habitation might seem a little thing to those who consider only the majesty of the Ainur, and not their terrible sharpness, as who should take the whole field of ardor for the foundation of a pillar, and so raise it until the cone of its summit were more bitter than a needle. Or who consider only the immeasurable vastness of the world, which still the Ainur are shaping, and not the minute precision to which they shape all things therein. But when the Ainur had beheld this habitation in a vision, and had seen the children of Ilovata arise therein, then many of the most mighty among them bent all their thought and their desire towards that place. And of these, Melkor was the chief, even as he was in the beginning the greatest of the Ainur who took part in the music. And he feigned, even to himself at first, that he desired to go thither and order all things for the good of the children of Ilovata, controlling the turmoils of the heat and the cold that had come to pass through him. But he desired rather to subdue to his will both elves and men, envying the gifts with which Ilovata promised to endow them, and he wished himself to have subjects and servants, and to be called Lord, and to be a master over other wills. 
But the other Ainur looked upon this habitation set within the vast spaces of the world, which the elves call Arda, the earth. And their hearts rejoiced in light, and their eyes beholding many colors were filled with gladness. But because of the roaring of the sea, they felt a great unquiet, and they observed the winds and the air, and the matters of which Arda was made, of iron and stone and silver, and gold, and many substances. But of all these, water they most greatly praised. And it is said by the Eldar that in water there lives yet the echo of the music of the Ainur, more than in any substance else that is in this earth. And many of the children of Ilavatar hearken still, unsated to the voices of the sea, and yet know not for what they listen. Now to water had that Ainu whom the elves call Ulmo turned his thought, and of all most deeply was he instructed by Iluvata in music. But of the airs and winds Manwe most had pondered, who was the noblest of the Ainur. Of the fabric of earth had Aule thought, to whom Iluvata had given skill and knowledge scarce less than to Melkor. But the delight and pride of Aule is in the deed of making, and in the thing made, and neither in possession nor in his own mastery. Wherefore he gives and hoards not, and is free from care, passing ever on to some new work. And Ilovata spoke to Ulmo, and said, Seest thou not how here in this little realm in the deeps of time Melkor hath made war upon thy province? He hath bethought him of bitter cold immoderate, and yet hath not destroyed the beauty of thy fountains, nor of thy clear pools. Behold the snow, and the cunning work of frost. Melkor hath devised heats and fire without restraint, and hath not dried up thy desire, nor utterly quelled the music of the sea. Behold, rather, the height and glory of the clouds and the ever-changing mists, and listen to the fall of rain upon the earth. And in these clouds thou art drawn nearer to Manwe, thy friend, whom thou lovest. Then Ulmo answered, Truly water is become now fairer than my heart imagined. Neither had my secret thought conceived the snowflake, nor in all my music was contained the falling of the rain. I will seek Manwe, that he and I may make melodies forever to thy delight. And Manwe and Ulmo have from the beginning been allied, and in all things have served most faithfully the purpose of Iluvata. But even as Ulmo spoke, and while the Ainur were yet gazing upon this vision, it was taken away and hidden from their sight. And it seemed to them that in that moment they perceived a new thing, darkness, which they had not known before except in thought. But they had become enamored of the beauty of the vision, and engrossed in the unfolding of the world, which came there to being, and their minds were filled with it. For the history was incomplete, and the circles of time not full wrought when the vision was taken away. And some have said that the vision ceased ere the fulfillment of the dominion of men and the fading of the firstborn. Wherefore, though the music is over all, the valor have not seen as with sight the later ages or the ending of the world. Then there was unrest among the Ainur. But Ilovata called to them and said, I know the desire of your minds that what ye have seen should verily be, not only in your thought, but even as ye yourselves are and yet other. Therefore I say, Ea, let these things be. And I will send forth into the void the flame imperishable, and it shall be at the heart of the world, 
and the world shall be. And those of you that will may go down into it. And suddenly the Ainur saw afar off a light, as it were a cloud with a living heart of flame. And they knew that this was no vision only, but that Ilovata had made a new thing, Ea, the world that is. Thus it came to pass that of the Ainur some abode still with Ilovata beyond the confines of the world. But others, and among them many of the greatest and most fair, took the leave of Ilovata and descended into it. But this condition Ilovata made, or it is the necessity of their love, that their power should thenceforward be contained and bounded in the world, to be within it for ever, until it is complete, so that they are its life and it is theirs. And therefore they are named the Valar, the powers of the world. But when the Valar entered into Ea, they were at first astounded and at a loss, for it was as if naught was yet made which they had seen in vision, and all was but on point to begin, and yet unshaped, and it was dark, for the great music had been but the growth and flowering of thought in the timeless halls, and the vision only a foreshowing. But now they had entered in at the beginning of time, and the Valar perceived that the world had been but foreshadowed and foresung, and they must achieve it. So began their great labours in wastes unmeasured and unexplored, and in ages uncounted and forgotten, until in the deeps of time and in the midst of the vast halls of Ea, they came to be that hour and that place where was made the habitation of the children of Ilovata. And in this work the chief part was taken by Manwe, and Aule, and Ulmo. But Melkor too was there from the first, and he meddled in all that was done, turning it, if he might, to his own desires and purposes, and he kindled great fires. When therefore earth was yet young and full of flame, Melkor coveted it, and he said to the other Valar, this shall be my own kingdom, and I name it unto myself. But Manwe was the brother of Melkor in the mind of Ilovata, and he was the chief instrument of the second theme that Ilovata had raised up against the discord of Melkor. And he called unto himself many spirits, both greater and less, and they came down into the fields of Arda and aided Manwe, lest Melkor should hinder the fulfilment of their labor for ever, and earth should wither ere it flowered. And Manwe said unto Melkor, This kingdom thou shalt not take for thine own wrongfully, for many others have labored here no less than thou. And there was strife between Melkor and the other Valar, and for that time Melkor withdrew and departed to other regions, and did there what he would. But he did not put the desire of the kingdom of Arda from his heart. Now the Valar took to themselves shape and hue, and because they were drawn into the world by love of the children of Ilovata, for whom they hoped, they took shape after that manner which they had beheld in the vision of Ilovata, save only in majesty and splendor. Moreover, their shape comes of the knowledge of the visible world, rather than of the world itself. And they need it not, save only as we use raiment. And yet we may be naked and suffer no loss of our being. Therefore the Valar may walk, if they will, unclad. And then even the Eldar cannot clearly perceive them, though they be present. But when they desire to clothe themselves, the Valar take upon them forms, some as of male and some as of female. For that difference of temper they had even from their beginning, and it is but bodied forth in the choice of each, 
not made by the choice. Even as with us male and female may be shown by the raiment, but is not made thereby. But the shapes wherein the great ones array themselves are not at all times like to the shapes of the kings and queens of the children of Ilovata. For at times they may clothe themselves in their own thought, made visible in forms of majesty and dread. And the Valar drew unto them many companions, some less, some well nigh as great as themselves, and they labored together in the ordering of the earth and the curbing of its tumults. Then Melkor saw what was done, and that the Valar walked on earth as powers visible, clad in the raiment of the world, and were lovely and glorious to see, and blissful, and that the earth was becoming as a garden for their delight, for its turmoils were subdued. His envy grew then the greater within him, and he also took visible form. But because of his mood and the malice that burned in him, that form was dark and terrible. And he descended upon Arda in power and majesty greater than any other of the Valar, as a mountain that wades in the sea and has its head above the clouds and is clad in ice and crowned with smoke and fire. And the light of the eyes of Melkor was like a flame that withers with heat and pierces with a deadly cold. Thus began the first battle of the Valar with Melkor for the dominion of Arda. And of those tumults the elves know but little. For what has here been declared is come from the Valar themselves, with whom the Eldalir spoke in the land of Valinor, and by whom they were instructed. But little would the Valar ever tell of the wars before the coming of the elves. Yet it is told among the Eldar that the Valar endeavored ever, in despite of Melkor, to rule the earth and to prepare it for the coming of the firstborn. And they built lands and Melkor destroyed them. Valleys they delved and Melkor raised them up. Mountains they carved and Melkor threw them down. Seas they hollowed and Melkor spilled them. And naught might have peace or come to lasting growth, for as surely as the Valar began a labor, so would Melkor undo it or corrupt it. And yet their labor was not all in vain. And though nowhere and in no work was their will and purpose wholly fulfilled, and all things were in human shape other than the Valar had at first intended, slowly nonetheless the earth was fashioned and made firm. And thus was the habitation of the children of Ilovata established at last in the deeps of time and amidst the innumerable stars. Valaquenta, account of the Valar and Maya according to the law of the Eldar. In the beginning, Eru, the One, who in the elvish tongue is named Iluvata, made the Ainur of his thought, and they made a great music before him. In this music, the world was begun. For Iluvata made visible the song of the Ainur, and they beheld it as a light in the darkness. And many among them became enamored of its beauty and of its history, which they saw beginning and unfolding as in a vision. Therefore, Ilovata gave to their vision being, and set it amid the void, and the secret fire was sent to burn at the heart of the world, and it was called Ea. Then those of the Ainur who desired it arose and entered into the world at the beginning of time, 
and it was their task to achieve it, and by their labours to fulfil the vision which they had seen. Long they laboured in the regions of Ea, which are vast beyond the thought of elves and men, until in the time appointed was made Arda, the kingdom of earth. Then they put on the raiment of earth, and descended into it, and dwelt therein. Of the Valar The great among these spirits the elves name the Valar, the powers of Arda, and men have often called them gods. The lords of the Valar are seven, and the Valia, the queens of the Valar, are seven also. These were the names in the elvish tongue as it was spoken in Valinor, though they have other names in the speech of the elves in Middle-earth, and their names among men are manifold. The names of the lords in due order are Manwe, Ulmo, Aule, Orome, Mandos, Lorian, and Tulkas. And the names of the queens are Varda, Yavana, Niena, Este, Vaire, Vana, and Nessa. Melkor is counted no longer among the Valar, and his name is not spoken upon earth. Manwe and Melkor were brethren in the thought of Iluvata. The mightiest of those Ainur who came into the world was in his beginning Melkor. But Manwe is dearest to Iluvata and understands most clearly his purposes. He was appointed to be, in the fullness of time, the first of all kings, lord of the realm of Arda and ruler of all that dwell therein. In Arda his delight is in the winds and the clouds and in all the regions of the air, from the heights to the depths, from the utmost borders of the Vale of Arda, to the breezes that blow in the grass. Sulimo he is surnamed, Lord of the Breath of Arda. All swift birds, strong of wing, he loves, and they come and go at his bidding. With Manwe dwells Varda, Lady of the Stars, who knows all the regions of Ea. Too great is her beauty to be declared in the words of men or of elves. For the light of Ilovata lives still in her face. In light is her power and her joy. Out of the deeps of Ea she came to the aid of Manwe. For Melkor she knew from before the making of the music, and rejected him, and he hated her, and feared her more than all others whom Eru made. Manwe and Varda are seldom parted, and they remain in Valinor. Their halls are above the everlasting snow, upon Oyulasa, the uttermost tower of Taniquetil, tallest of all the mountains upon earth. When Manwe there ascends his throne and looks forth, if Varda is beside him, he sees further than all other eyes, through mist and through darkness, and over the leagues of the sea. And if Manwe is with her, Varda hears more clearly than all other ears the sound of voices that cry from east to west, from the hills and the valleys, and from the dark places that Melkor has made upon earth. Of all the great ones who dwell in this world, the elves hold Varda most in reverence and love. Elbereth, they name her and they call upon her name out of the shadows of Middle-earth, and uplift it in song at the rising of the stars. Ulmo is the lord of waters. He is alone. He dwells nowhere long, but moves as he will in all the deep waters about the earth or under the earth. He is next in might to Manwe, and before Valinor was made, he was closest to him in friendship. But thereafter he went seldom to the councils of the Valar, unless great matters were in debate. For he kept all Arda in thought, 
and he has no need of any resting place. Moreover, he does not love to walk upon land, and will seldom clothe himself in a body after the manner of his peers. If the children of Eru beheld him, they were filled with a great dread, for the arising of the king of the sea was terrible as a mounting wave that strides to the land, with dark helm foam-crested and raiment of mail shimmering from silver down into shadows of green. The trumpets of Manwe are loud, but Ulmo's voice is deep as the deeps of the ocean, which he only has seen. Nonetheless, Ulmo loves both elves and men, and never abandoned them, not even when they lay under the wrath of the Valar. At times he will come unseen to the shores of Middle-earth, or pass far inland up firths of the sea, and there make music upon his great horns, the Ulumuri, that are wrought of white shell. And those to whom that music comes hear it ever after in their hearts, and longing for the sea never leaves them again. But mostly Ulmo speaks to those who dwell in Middle-earth with voices that are heard only as the music of water. For all seas, lakes, rivers, fountains and springs are in his government, so that the elves say that the spirit of Ulmo runs in all the veins of the world. Thus news comes to Ulmo, even in the deeps, of all the needs and griefs of Arda, which otherwise would be hidden from Manwe. Aule has might little less than Ulmo. His lordship is over all the substances of which Arda is made. In the beginning he wrought much in fellowship with Manwe and Ulmo, and the fashioning of all lands was his labor. He is a smith and a master of all crafts, and he delights in works of skill, however small, as much as in the mighty building of old. His are the gems that lie deep in the earth, and the gold that is fair in the hand, no less than the walls of the mountains and the basins of the sea. The Noldor learned most of him, and he was ever their friend. Melkor was jealous of him, for Aule was most like himself in thought and in powers, and there was long strife between them, in which Melkor ever marred or undid the works of Aule, and Aule grew weary in repairing the tumults and disorders of Melkor. Both also desired to make things of their own that should be new and unthought of by others, and delighted in the praise of their skill. But Aule remained faithful to Eru and submitted all that he did to his will, and he did not envy the works of others, but sought and gave counsel. Whereas Melkor spent his spirit in envy and hate, and that at last he could make nothing save in mockery of the thought of others, and all their works he destroyed if he could. The spouse of Aule is Yavanna, the giver of fruits. She is the lover of all things that grow in the earth, and all their countless forms she holds in her mind, from the trees like towers in forests long ago, to the moss upon stones, or the small and secret things in the mold. In reverence, Yavanna is next to Vada, among the queens of the Valar. In the form of a woman, she is tall and robed in green, but at times she takes other shapes. Some there are who have seen her standing like a tree under heaven, crowned with the sun, and from all its branches there spilled a golden dew upon the barren earth. And it grew green with corn, but the roots of the tree were in the waters of Ulmo, and the winds of Manwe spoke in its leaves. Kemantari, Queen of the Earth, she is surnamed in the Eldarin tongue. The Feanturi, Masters of spirits are brethren, and they are called most often Mandos and Lorian. Yet these are rightly the names of the places of their dwelling, and their true names are Namo and Irmo. Namo, the elder, dwells in Mandos, which is westward in Valinor. He is the keeper of the houses of the dead, and the summoner of the spirits of the slain. He forgets nothing 
and he knows all things that shall be, save only those that lie still in the freedom of Iluvata. He is the doomsman of the Valar, but he pronounces his dooms and his judgments only at the bidding of Manwe. Vare, the weaver, is his spouse, who weaves all things that have ever been in time into her storied webs, and the halls of Mandos that ever widen as the ages pass are clothed with them. Irmo the Younger is the master of visions and dreams. In Lorien are his gardens in the land of the Valar, and they are the fairest of all places in the world, filled with many spirits. Este, the gentle healer of hurts and of weariness, is his spouse. Grey is her raiment, and rest is her gift. She walks not by day, but sleeps upon an island in the tree-shadowed lake of Lorelin. From the fountains of Irmo and Este, all those who dwell in Valinor draw refreshment, and often the Valar come themselves to Lorien, and there find repose and easing of the burden of Arda. Mightier than Este is Niena, sister of the Feanturi. She dwells alone, she is acquainted with grief, and mourns for every wound that Arda has suffered in the marring of Melkor. So great was her sorrow as the music unfolded, that her song turned to lamentation long before its end, and the sound of mourning was woven into the themes of the world before it began. But she does not weep for herself. And those who hearken to her learn pity and endurance in hope. Her halls are west of west, upon the borders of the world, and she comes seldom to the city of Valimar, where all is glad. She goes rather to the halls of Mandos, which are near to her own. And all those who wait in Mandos cry to her, for she brings strength to the spirit and turns sorrow to wisdom. The windows of her house look outward from the walls of the world. Greatest in strength and deeds of prowess is Tulkas, who is surnamed Astaldo the Valiant. He came last to Arda to aid the Valar in the first battles with Melkor. He delights in wrestling and in contests of strength, and he rides no steed, for he can outrun all things that go on feet, and he is tireless. His hair and beard are golden, and his flesh ruddy. His weapons are his hands. He has little heed for either the past or the future, and is of no avail as a counsellor, but is a hardy friend. His spouse is Nessa, the sister of Orome, and she also is lithe and fleet-footed. Dear she loves, and they follow her train whenever she goes in the wild. But she can outrun them swift as an arrow with the wind in her hair. In dancing she delights, and she dances in Valimar on lawns of never-fading green. Orome is a mighty lord. If he is less strong than Tulkas, he is more dreadful in anger, whereas Tulkas laughs ever in sport or in war, and even in the face of Melkor he laughed in battles before the elves were born. Orome loved the lands of Middle-earth, and he left them unwillingly, and came last to Valinor. And often of old he passed back east over the mountains, and returned with his host to the hills and the plains. He is a hunter of monsters and fell beasts, and he delights in horses and in hounds. And all trees he loves, for which reason he is called Alderon, and by the Sindar, Tauron the lord of forests. Naha is the name of his horse, white in the sun and shining silver at night. The Valaroma is the name of his great horn, the sound of which is like the upgoing of the sun in scarlet, or the sheer lightning cleaving the clouds. Above all the horns of his host it was heard in the woods that Yavanna brought forth in Valinor. For there, Orome would train his folk and his beasts for the pursuit of the evil creatures of Melkor. 
The spouse of Orome is Vana, the ever young. She is the younger sister of Yavana. All flowers spring as she passes, and open if she glances upon them, and all birds sing at her coming. These are the names of the Valar and the Valia, and here is told in brief their likenesses, such as the Eldar beheld them in Amman. But fair and noble as were the forms in which they were manifest to the children of Ilovata, they were but a veil upon their beauty and their power. And if little is here said of all that the Eldar once knew, that is as nothing compared with their true being, which goes back into regions and ages far beyond our thought. Among them, nine were of chief power and reverence. But one is removed from their number, and eight remain. The Arata, the High Ones of Arda. Manwe and Vada, Ulmo, Yavana and Aule, Mandos, Niena, and Orome. Though Manwe is their king and holds their allegiance under Eru, in majesty they are peers, surpassing beyond compare all others, whether of the Valar and the Maya, or of any other order that Ilovata has sent into Ea. End of side one.